meditate on Sri Ramakrishna for peace and prosperity of the whole humanity. Om Stapakaya Chadamasya Sarvadamaswarupine Stapakaya Chadamasya Sarvadamaswarupine Avatara Varishthaya Rama Krishna Ayate Namaha Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyote Gamaya Pratyorama Mritangamaya Om Shanti 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 let us offer our salutations to Sri Ramakrishna, the embodiment of all religions, the Supreme God incarnate. Let us pray to Him to lead us from the unreal to the real, to lead us from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge, to lead us from death to immortality. In the last class, we talked about charity as a spiritual discipline and what Sri Ramakrishna had said about charity. And Sri Ramakrishna has said that one should do charity without any uh, motive. So, if he does that for the love of God, <coughs> and if he gives charity thinking that he was only the instrument God alone is a doer and He is nothing. So if He gives charity with this attitude, then it is very noble. It makes the donor very humble and the donor will have immense spiritual benefit and He can march onwards in the spiritual path. Finally, He will realize the infinite bliss so, one should cherish this attitude of doing service, rendering service, taking complete refuge in God. So, charity as a spiritual discipline, it helps us to go close to God. There's a word in Sanskrit called Kripan, Kripan, miserly. We have dealt with this uh, word miserly in the last class. In Brahadaranika Upanishad, the great Yajnavalkya Maharshi tells Gargi, one who departs from this world without knowing this Atman or Brahman is a Kripan, means pitiable. Another great uh, saint, Madhusudan Saraswati, explaining the phrase given by Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, Kripanaha Phalahetavaha, Madhusudan Saraswati explains, miserly people earn wealth with great pains, they devote most of the time in acquiring wealth just to satisfy their thirst only for some insignificant visible pleasure, just for that. He has got a lot of money, he goes and buys big farmland. Just he uses up the money in order to enjoy. They are unable to experience the great happiness that comes from charity so, in their actions, in their ways of doing, they cheat themselves. Similarly, those who perform action with great pains out of desire for mere petty results, they become deprived of the experience of supreme bliss from realizing Atman or God. This is the state of affairs of those who are Kripanas. So, there are three 
implications of the word kripan it's a sanskrit word one is an intensely acquisitive and possessive he gets agitated even at the very thought of the possibility of losing any of his or her belongings in fact their very existence identity as it were seems to depend on them their possessions are everything for them they are so much attached they won't like to give any of them to anybody they want to enjoy themselves in fact to give an example how duryodhan was uh, having that nature of possessing he didn't want to give even an inch of land to the pandavas who were uh, to have legitimately but he was so miserly he would not part with even an inch of land on the other hand he was prepared to wage war he became so much jealous of his cousins he even made a plot to annihilate them anyway that's one intensely acquisitive and possessive nature secondly he is dominated by worldly expectations he expects too much that is uh, he becomes a shop keeping person he bargains it becomes business like well i do this i must get this back in return so his act of giving is always linked with what he gets back for his pleasure thirdly a person who is of this miserly nature he is devoid of spiritual aspiration or any understanding of the spiritual aspect of one's personality so he doesn't uh, understand the spiritual significance of the human life he just thinks he is here on this earth to just to enjoy even by plundering the people by doing any action that would satisfy his senses well charity in a spiritual sense is a very powerful catalyst for transforming a miserly into a great spiritual person we may be able to sense the true scope of dana charity from a low intensity giving away of small things in charity giving away small things to the spiritually mature arjun like inner stability to face death or withstand loss of possessions friends and relatives to the highest form of dana charity as tyag renunciation so charity takes a spiritual meaning when you cultivate the virtue of renunciation that means what do i need everything belongs to god everything should go to him so in that act of renunciation you are satisfied with whatever things you have not aspiring unnecessarily things which are not useful and which are not needed that is as detachment towards one's own body towards one's own self identity that is psychosomatic to affirm that which is spiritual this is why dana charity is so essential for spiritual growth so together with uh, repeating divine name meditating on god we must also practice regular charity no matter how little in the beginning it has got immense spiritual value in the act of giving you develop the love there is a sanskrit words data lagurapi sevyo bhavati न कृपण महान समृद्धया कूपवंत स्वादुजल प्रीत लोक से न समुद्र द मीनिंग इज ए डोनर ईवन दो पुहोर एंड ए गिवर ऑफ ओनली स्मॉल थिंग्स 
is worthy of worship not so miserly even if he is greatly wealthy a well with sweet drinking water serves to please people not so the vast salty ocean so we should practice charity to become real spiritual seekers we should gradually turn off self love and material concerns into universal love and spiritual aspiration through charity the scriptures reveal some details about this the vedas the mine of spiritual ideas starting from the birth of the being unto the death and even beyond death everything is well organized and methods are given how one should conduct oneself in order to fulfill in order to make his life blessed so the vedas recognize the fact that human beings are constitutionally self seekers and they are driven by desires and mundane goals it is very natural so what the vedas say it gives a good turn you want money health longevity beauty power safety a good partner you desire to have all this very well and the vedas say there is a yagna for fulfilling such and such a desire by adoring such and such a deity for example uh, there was a couple who didn't have issues so they approached a rishi and the rishi said you perform this yagna you will get the child and they would do and they would get it in fact uh, the great ramayan we hear the story of rama rama lakshmana bharat satrugna they were born to dasharath he performed putra kameshti yaga he invited the proper priests to conduct it and it was done according to vedic injunctions and he got the result so naturally a human being like cattle drawn by fresh grass jumps at such offers and sets out to perform the rituals in fact the rituals are all oriented with results if you do this ritual you will get this particular result but a noteworthy fact is that every ritual includes charity and austerity in fact the ritual gives a training to you to cultivate the virtue of charity and to become austere before and during the rituals sometimes spread over several days the performer has to observe all the rules meant to subdue his ego and he will have to undergo some austerity waking up and bathing early having only one meal a day avoiding stimulants and luxuries sleeping on a mat spread on the floor various disciplines are prescribed in order to perform certain rituals in fact they uh, they should be followed very strictly then only they will get the desired result not only that the person who is doing ritual he will have to give away several of his dear things in charity sometimes he will have to give gold silver cattle etc that's also prescribed prescribed by the upanishads uh, prescribed by the scriptures everything is specified so thus the vedic charity was a sugar coated medicine as it were against the miserly mentality a double edged sword so to say which on the one hand uh, promised to secure worldly gains and under that pretext on the other hand finally sliced away human attachments to arouse dispassion and renunciation in all the rituals he is adoring god he is worshiping so he comes close to god though in the beginning for the worldly desires finally his mind gets uh, turned towards god and then he seeks god forming an inseparable part of those attractive rituals had an inherent power to strengthen faith in god as the fulfiller 
of wants and to create a willingness to give away first material things and finally one's individuality. So, the Vedas reveal that true charity should have a religious basis. Secondly, it must involve some degree of genuine self-denial and self-control. A few coins casually thrown at a beggar from a bus or a car or a train do not constitute charity, nor does a pittance given away out of one's huge profits or resources deserve to be called charity or be expected to increase love for God. This answers why the prevailing customary charity, alms giving, etc., do not bring about any spiritual benefit to the millions of donors who are doing that kind of charity. And nowadays is by and large secular and more importantly devoid of humility. Exceptions apart, secular minded charity in daily life turns as experience shows into a spiritual expedient, uh, into a simple expedient to get rid of the irksome beggar at one's door. In order to get him out, not to ask him to get out, they throw some money so the beggar can go. So, there is no feeling of uh, reverence to the person whom he is giving charity. So, if he is giving that if he, if he is giving charity with the egoistic attitude, then he will not have any spiritual benefit. Many people uh, do charities in order to get name and fame and uh, position, power. See, many people, sometimes they, when the politicians come, they go in the forefront and they ask the organizers to announce their name. Such and such a person has given such amount and he is giving such amount to the particular political party and his picture, everything comes in the newspaper. Why he is doing that? Because he will get benefit later on. If a person gives donation to a politician and that politician when he becomes a minister, he will grant so many favors for the person who donated money to him. So anyway, it ends up like that. It has no spiritual benefit and it is uh, actually the charity, the quality of charity is abused in a way. So we have to understand charity has got a great spiritual value. As a spiritual discipline, it has been defined as arthanam patre shraddhaya pradidanam. That is, giving material things to a deserving person with shraddha. It implies a firm faith in God and spiritual aspiration. Again, the scriptures, to prevent any worldly calculation from polluting the purity of charity, it says, Vidyate sagrasyanto dhanasyanto na vidyate. It tells, ocean has boundaries, but charity has no limits. And to emphasize the crucial importance of humility, in rendering charity spiritually potent, the Shuddhi Tattva, another scripture says, that charity which is performed by going to the needy is incalculably beneficial. And another scripture says, charity should be done with bhakti, with devotion. That is, a giver must be self-effacing enough to go to the needy person and give with devotion, with the thought of God in one's mind and with the idea that the receiver is God in disguise. So, this charity can be taken up as a spiritual practice, it will certainly give us immense results. As your mind gets purified, as you become more and more free from ego, pride, you will get the benefits of joy, satisfaction, peace and an unmistakable spiritual stirring deep within. And then you love to give. In fact, there are many people who really do charities without their names being disclosed. Their attitude is spiritual, definitely it helps them. And one can see God through practicing charity as a discipline. And there's a famous story in our scriptures in India. There was a, a great king. Of course, he was the king of the demons. Somehow he got the leadership of the heavens. He began to rule. The devatas were defeated and uh, this 
demon became the king. His name is Bali, Bali Chakravart. Of course, he was uh, ruling the kingdom, but all the devatas were humiliated and they were all very sad because the heavens are the abode of gods, angels, devatas. So the the rakshasas, the demons, have got separate land for them to live upon. Anyway, then Lord Vishnu, the creator, incarnated himself as a brahmacharin. His name is Vaman. And he came to the court of uh, King Bali in order to ask him. Because the king had one noble quality. He would give charity to whomsoever. And he had so much of confidence in himself. And he would give so lovingly. And Lord Vishnu himself came to test this quality in this person. And then the story goes and he, uh, as a brahmacharya, he goes and asks him to give him three, three feet measured land. Anyway, in that process he got the whole earth, whole uh, planet and heavens. They were covered by two feet and the, where to keep the third foot, he was asking. And Bali Chakravarti was in a fix. Then immediately he said, well, don't hesitate. You put your feet on my head. My head is still there. It is not given to anybody. You put your head on me. Put your foot on my head. Like that the Bali Chakravarti said. And immediately the Lord placed his foot on the head of this Bali. He was highly blessed to be touched by the feet of Lord Vishnu, the creator, the sustainer of the universe. And he was totally purified and he was immersed in samadhi. He was in perpetual joy. All these things Bali Chakruti could get on account of his noble quality of charity and he would give away without any expectation. So he got the spiritual benefit. He could see God and he uh, enjoyed all peace and bliss in the company of God. So charity should be practiced as a spiritual discipline. Anyway, for anything to be practiced as a discipline, your aspiration should be to realize God. That's important. If, if if you have worldly aspirations, then it will have negative effect. That concludes this uh, topic, charity as a spiritual discipline. I am reading some passages from the Gospel, page 708. But the case of Ishwar Koti is different. He follows a process of negation and affirmation. First he negates the world, realizing that it is not Brahman, but then he affirms the same world, seeing it as the manifestation of Brahman. To give an illustration, a man wanting to claim to the roof of roof first negates the stairs as not being the roof but on reaching the roof he finds that the stairs are made of the same materials as the roof brick lime and brick dust then when he came then when he can either move up and down the stairs or remain on the roof as he pleases and of course i've read this on the page 709 narendra entered the room and saluted the master they began to talk together Presently the master came down from the couch and sat on the floor on which a mat had been spread. In the meantime, the room had been filled with people, both devotees and visitors. Master said to Narendra, Are you well? I hear that you often visit Girish Ghosh at his house. Is it true? Narendra answered, Yes, sir. I go there now and then. Girish had been visiting Sri Ramakrishna for some months. The master said that none could fathom the depth of Girish's faith. And his longing for God was as intense as his faith was deep. At home, he was always absorbed in the thought of Sri Ramakrishna. Many of the master's devotees visited him. They talked only about Sri Ramakrishna. But Girish was a householder who had had varied experiences of worldly life. And the master knew that Narendra would renounce the world, that he would shun lust and gold both mentally and outwardly. Master said, Do you visit Girish frequently? No matter how much one washes a cup that has contained a solution of garlic, still a trace of the smell will certainly linger. The youngsters who come here are pure souls, untouched by lust and gold. Men who have associated a long time with lust and gold smell of the garlic as it were. They are like a mango picked by crows. Such a fruit cannot be offered to the deity in the temple, and you would hesitate to eat it yourself. Again, take the case of a new pot and another 
in which curd has been made. One is afraid to keep milk in the second part for the milk very often turns sour. Household devotees like Girish from a former class by themselves, they desire yoga and also bhoga. Their attitude is that of Ravan who wanted to enjoy the maidens of heaven and at the same time realize Rama. They are like the asuras, the demons who enjoy various pleasures and also realize Narayan. Narendra said, But Girish has given up his old associates. Master said, Yes, yes, he is like a bull castrated in old age. In Burdwan, I once saw an ox moving about the cows. I asked a bullock cart driver, What is this? An ox? How strange! He said to me, True, sir, but it was castrated in old age, and so it has not altogether shaken off the old tendencies. In a certain place, there sat some sannyasis. A young woman happened to pass by. All continued as before to meditate on God, except one of them who cast sidelong glances at her. Before becoming a monk, he had been the father of three children. If you make a solution of garlic in a cup, won't it be hard to remove the smell from it? Can a worthless tree like the babul produce mangoes? Of course, such a thing may become possible through the occult powers of a yogi, but can everyone acquire such powers? When have worldly people time to think of God? A man wanted to engage a pandit who would explain the Bhagavad to him. His friend said, I know of an excellent pandit, but there is one difficulty. He does a great deal of farming. He has four plows and eight bullocks and is always busy with them. He has no leisure. Thereupon the man said, I don't care for a pandit who has no leisure. I am not looking for a Bhagavad scholar burdened with plows and bullocks. I want a pandit who can really expound the sacred book to me. Let us stop. But Sri Ramakrishna uh, had to work very hard to see how Girish is totally drawn towards him. And it was not an easy task. In fact, he personally cleansed him in a way. He remarked afterwards, Do you know why I am suffering from this throat cancer? It is because I took all the sins of Girish Chandra Ghosh. So, I had to suffer from this throat cancer. The reason is, he, he, he doesn't have to suffer, but generally they follow the law of nature. The law of nature, whatever the sins are there, they, are, they should be burnt. If A is not burning them, B should burn. Proxy. So, anyway, the vessel that is containing garlic will smell garlic. It means a person who is having tendencies towards these worldly things. So, however much he may try to get rid of the worldly samskaras, still it lingers on. He just made a remark. That means you must take proper care to be alert and sometimes you have to tolerate. Even if that smell comes, all right, because I am using the garlic cup, so garlic smell is there. So you will develop a kind of detachment. And uh, the point is, you must be, somehow you must try to connect yourself to God. The connection to God becomes difficult as long as the mind is tied with worldly samskaras. So the purification of samskaras is a spiritual practice. How you purify yourself? By what manner? In what, by what methods? It's one way of explaining. Unless you help a person, how does he know? So Sri Ram, Sri Ram showed what is the meaning of longing. How one should long. He showed in his own life the intensity of longing. That means you must desire it intensely. That's the meaning of longing. Not uh, half and half. Uh, you may or you may not. If you don't have that intensity, you won't. That longing will not give result. Intense longing. And all the spiritual, it is true, everything is in one, in one's 
way everything is will the will of god that's true but are you that is a theory but that you should realize through your experience when do you realize by doing spiritual practices when you make spiritual advancement then you will realize then you will know how oh, how god is gracious how everything is god's will i am only insignificant creature i am just an instrument a channel through which god's energy god's manifestation works like that you feel that not to feel that you must have to pass through certain disciplines and purification that's all so the whole thing is a game in a way spiritual sri ramakrishna himself he says leela kshetra the whole thing is leela kshetra and everyone is uh, suffering it may be untrue from the vedantic point of view from the vedantic point of view it's all a dream but you know it when you wake up then only you will know i was in dream when you are alive when you are active in dream you are not aware that you are in dream so our waking state here is like that as long as we are ignorant of the true self we are all in a state of dream as it were we are coming going etc where is coming and going for the atman so there is a point so the soul that is the the embodied being the mind the consciousness associated with the mind is called the jiva so it is the mind that makes the soul come back and forth and mind is full of desires full of things to be uh, fulfilled so it pushes the soul to take birth that's one interpretation another interpretation is though we are the we are all having different minds etc we are all connected inseparably to god in fact we are all moving running towards god only undoubtedly but some are running straight some are running in a crooked way but they are all running everybody is running knowingly or unknowingly the truth is that but if you know it you will enjoy the glory of god more that's all be connected to god that's what the scriptures say don't think that they are the end of the life it's true you are in the money and uh, know the technique of using that money in a proper way but how many people use it in that fashion when they the more money they get the more egoistic they become they boast themselves and they declare themselves i am and they uh, they want to uh, claim more status for the because they have got so much wealth and they want to have some separate status for them anyway the point is this you may earn money do everything if you have the attitude of a duty i have got duties and responsibilities i have got duty towards my wife towards my family towards my children very good you discharge your duties properly at the same time think of god so thinking of god is the first priority think of god and then perform the duties then they they are helpful the performing duties will purify your heart it makes you responsible also otherwise you will become irresponsible you can do anything if you don't have the duties but if you have the duties you know you must do it it's a must is a mandatory but think of god and do it everything will becomes and you will be able to get a special power of strength to bear with all the sufferings and you'll be able to pass through all experiences difficult situations joyfully that's all see doing charity in your home is a first step and uh, of course it is a it helps you undoubtedly but doing charity to the people at large there has got great spiritual significance say for example uh, there's a national calamity uh, in gujarat suddenly the earthquake thousands of people just vanished disappeared but when the the world the when the world came to know about it how all people the rushed help that is charity to give some kind of relief to the people who are suffering intensely that charity has got great spiritual value because you are trying to express your love towards your fellow beings so it involves selfless uh, love doing in your home that is uh, is not considered selfless though you are doing it because they are your family so you are doing but doing for the people whom you don't know that is real service in fact 
I, I know many people who help the students in their education without disclosing their name. That's the right way of doing. So, what's the need of my disclosing my name? Because I, I've got some desire. My name should be known to people and my great... my children my grandchildren my great grandchildren should know about why should they know why should they have to know if they if they if they have to learn they will learn through their through their own samskaras they will learn you don't have to advertise no the, the point i'm telling uh, you become more and more humble that's the idea to be free from ego more humble you must become that's the value of spirituality humbleness how far you are humble there is a measure there is a test of your spirituality if a person is egoistic then it shows he is little far away from realization of the truth <laughs> a person who has realized the truth is always very humble take shri ramakrishna humblest of the humble ko naren he was uh, he was born perfect so shri ramakrishna didn't have any doubt about naren at all because you need tested him who is this narayan he was one of the saptarshis who came down to help shri ramakrishna's mission so he very well knew that nobody in this earth can shake narendra he knew very well and swami shri ramakrishna himself tells narendra can go and eat anywhere he can go and eat anywhere anything nothing will happen to him because he is such a strong person strongest we should say so he had not any doubt about uh, narendra at all and he just asked him and in a way of course in order to teach people in order to teach others he might have told that uh, <clears throat> better to have uh, association uh, where a person can be safe instead of uh, being associated with a person who is uh, uh, tainted uh, whose mind is tainted with impurities so that's the idea and anyway uh, he gives the example of that one of the monk was uh, glancing when the women were passing because he had he was the father of the ch- children before becoming a monk so that it was lingering in his mind though he had become a monk so that is the purpose of garlic uh, s- smell it is telling so even though he has become a monk still slightly he began to even to see why that idea came to came to him to see even he should not have done is it not no he is trying to explain in different different ways and so that is the way that's how i take it narendra was uh, totally pure he was uh, purest of the pure i should say narendra nath <laughs> and shiram knew it very well because he was very pure he could see light every day before going to sleep he asked also his friends are you seeing light before people no no we don't see anything then shri ramakrishna when he met shri ramakrishna shri ramakrishna himself asked him are you seeing the light every day he was startled what how did you come to know so shri ramakrishna knew everything about vivekananda shri ramakrishna would know everything about anybody everybody who would come to him but just seeing he could read everybody's mind but he is giving the lessons so that people can learn and uh, it is true a specific uh, teaching is given to a specific person but you must know that uh, the whole all the people can be classified in, into broad groups so under what classification we come that's the point so if the shiram has said so many things in the uh, gospel and uh, instructions to advise instructions to householders instructions to sannyasins instructions to novices and uh, so many are there but you take according to your temperament what you need you take that much and get benefited it's just like uh, uh, shri krishna telling in the bhagavad gita he has given four yogas but which yoga you want to practice according to your capacity you take and practice it now the point is he proved he was prepared to sacrifice everything in order to you know to honor that uh, the quality of uh, charity he was prepared to that's why he offered his own head because he was very much uh, particular about fulfilling his own uh, promise what he had told and it was a test for him and because he proved the test lord himself blessed him he he placed his foot is it is it is very easy to get the touch of the lord's feet 
and he was extremely blessed and by the touch of the foot of lord vishnu he became was ecstatic and he lost all his asuric qualities what is asura after all asura means anything everything excess in him everything excess pleasure excess 100 times more than human beings everything is like excess beyond limits that's called asura so uh, because he had that merit he had some qualities so he became the king of the heavens without merit he would not have become the king of the heavens at all in the first place because he was a demon he had some demonic qualities that's true and moreover it was not proper uh, for him to stay on in the heavens because the heavens is the place where the angels the gods should live upon it is a, it is a reserved for them it's just like in earth human beings are there like every planet has got certain uh, things to stay on so and moreover the devatas they prayed for they they lost their uh, position for the place etc and so god himself incarnated to set right to, to keep the things right because he was a, as a sustainer of the universe so lord himself took the uh, incarnated himself as vaman is a big very big book vaman purana is there very big book i think it is uh, translated in english also united nations have translated it extremely good book and uh, and he comes and even the guru even the bali chakravarti is guru tells him warns him don't do it he is not a simply brahmachari he is he is god himself coming in this form so don't uh, be hasty in uh, giving away things like that but he didn't care he went to the ex- he went to the extent of telling, even if i lose myself it doesn't matter when i say i give i must give he is adhering to the tr- truth that's the greatest quality see we talk of uh, spiritual ideas how do you know that you are well established in them the tests will come when the circumstances come how you behave do you hold on to those ideas which you are cherishing or you give way if you hold on then it gives you blessing and you will turn out to be very good in fact god makes some uh, some episodes become some episodes occur in order to glorify the devotee in fact uh, the story of purandar das comes there purandar das a very great saint he was extremely miserly a big story a thrilling story finally he, he totally was transformed because of the wife's quality because of his wife's devotion to lord vishnu so much so the, the most miserly man became most charitable person he took away everything from the shop distributed to the people everything he never kept anything to himself and both of them they went to the streets mendicants singing the glory of god and just spreading the teachings of god spiritual ideas all these poems are extremely good poems spiritual contents are there so like that true they you must you must take the meaning this way here ati because bali went ati so he lost his kingdom that's true in a materialistic sense he lost it he was he was pushed to patal lok there is a meaning there you should not take the context of the other way uh, because he was blessed by god etc i am telling you but these people have they quote that you not to tell that point if you do excess you lose everything that's the idea there because that is it that's to glorify prakhlada narsimha came because the hiranyakashipu he challenged him you are talking about vishnu he is present everywhere he is everywhere let me see whether he comes and protects you now i will right right now i will kill you like that he, he posed a challenge and he jumped from the throne with a sword drawn not to cut off his head that was a crucial test in that test also he was unshaken in his love towards god and he was repeating narayan's name he not to save the child he not to glorify prakhlada nasima came like that did. everything has got its meaning in the play now right, we shall stop chant the name of the lord and his glory unceasingly that the mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quench that mighty forest fire worldly lust raging furiously within o name stream down in moonlight on the lotus heart opening its cup to knowledge of thyself o self drown deep in the waves of his bliss tasting his nectar at every step bathing in his name that bath for weary souls various are thy names o lord in each and every name thy power resides no times are set no rites are needful for chanting of thy name so vast is thy mercy how huge then is thy wretchedness who find in this empty life and heart no devotion to thy name 
Oh, my mind, be humbler than a blade of grass. Be patient and forbearing like a tree. Take no honor to thyself. Give honor to all. Chant and succinctly the name of the Lord. O Lord and soul of the universe, mine is no prayer for wealth or retinue. The playthings of lust or the toys of fame. As many times as I may be reborn, grant me, O Lord, a steadfast love for thee. A drowning man in this world's fearful ocean is thy servant, O sweet one. In thy mercy, consider him as just beneath thy feet. Ah, how I long for the day when an instant the separation from thee, O Lord, will be as a thousand years, when my heart burns away with its desire, and the world without thee is a heartless void. Prostrate at thy feet let me be in unwavering devotion, neither imploring the embrace of thine arms, nor bewailing the withdrawal of thy presence, though it tears my soul asunder. O thou who stillest the hearts of thy devotees, do with me what thou wilt, for thou art my heart's beloved, thou and thou alone. O Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness to light, and lead us from death to immortality. May all be free from dangers, may all realize what is good, may all be actuated by noble thoughts, may all rejoice everywhere. May all be happy, may all be free from disease, may all realize what is good, may none be subject to misery. May the wicked become virtuous, May the virtues attain tranquility. May the tranquil be free from bonds. May the freed make others free. May good be dead all people. May the sovereign righteously rule the earth. May all beings ever attain what is good. May the worlds be prosperous and happy. May the clouds pour rain in time. May the earth be blessed with crops. May all countries be freed from calamity. May holy men live without fear. May the Lord the destroyer of sins, the presiding deity of all sacred works be satisfied. For he being pleased, the whole universe becomes pleased. He being satisfied, the whole universe feels satisfied.